Hello and welcome to the Centre for Psychoanalytic Studies Open Seminar Series for 2014-15. My name is Hannah Curtis and I'm the organiser of the series for this academic year. The Open Seminars are a series of seminars that take place through the academic year roughly on a monthly basis and they are an opportunity for us to invite speakers to talk on a subject of interest to them that has links to psychoanalysis. The series is open to all members of the university, students and staff, and also to the general public. The seminars are regularly attended by people who work in the local community, usually in a clinical field to do with mental health and well-being. People such as counsellors, psychotherapists, psychologists and mental health professionals. As the Centre for Psychoanalytic Studies grows, many of our courses and our open seminar series are of interest to an ever-widening group of professional colleagues throughout the health and care sector. Sometimes the speakers are academics within the Centre for Psychoanalytic Studies, sometimes they are in other departments in the University of Essex, and sometimes they are speakers who may or may not be academics from outside of the university. This year we have Professor Stephen Growark talking about war and maturity from a psychoanalytic perspective. We have Joachim Willemsen who is on the academic staff in the centre discussing the thinking of Lacan in relation to clinical work. We have Jim Hopkins who is looking at the first year of life from the perspective of neurological developments and psychological developments. And this is just in the first term. In the second term, Christina Wieland, who has just published an important book on the fascist state of mind, will discuss the development of masculinity. From that point on, we have members of the academic team presenting a range of papers on their chosen research. And this will be an opportunity to hear what the academic staff are thinking about and questioning and also to get to know the academic staff from this perspective a bit more fully. As ever, it promises to be a stimulating series that will give rise to many interesting questions, opinions and hopefully some very good arguments. We will also be able to learn a great deal from people who have put time and energy and commitment into researching and writing about a particular subject and its links with psychoanalysis. We very much hope to see you at the open seminars and that you will also benefit from being able to watch and listen again to the talks and discussions. Thank you. This is the third seminar this term, this year, uh, in the Open Seminar Series and the last one for this term. We'll be starting again next term on the 28th of January when Christina Wieland is going to be talking um, and I think she's going to be presenting something from her book that's recently been published on the fascist state of mind and the manufacture of masculinity. So that's in um, that's to see the new year off in, in the new year. But this evening, <coughs> we've got um, Professor Jim Hopkins from King's College London, who, as you know, is going to talk about psychoanalysis, developmental psychology and neuroscience, consilience over the first year of life. So Jim Hopkins is a visiting professor in the psychoanalysis psychoanalysis unit in UCL and emeritus reader in philosophy at King's College London and was cohort visiting professor, professor of social thought at the University of Chicago for 2008. He was the editor with Richard Walheim on philosophical essays on Freud, CUP and Anthony Saville of psychoanalysis, mind and art, Blackwell. Many of his essays, including recent work on psychoanalysis, attachment, evolution, interpretation of consciousness, and neuroscience, are available at www.jimhopkins.org. 
Um, I'm not going to read his abstract, because you've seen that on the posters, but um, I'm very pleased to welcome Professor Hopkins to the University of Essex and particularly to the Centre for Psychoanalytic Studies this evening. He will talk for a while and then hopefully we'll have a lively discussion and we'll close at 6.30. Okay, well, obviously these are large topics that uh, can't be gone into in detail here, so you'll notice that many of the things that I say are short on detail, but I think, in this case, I think the details can be filled out, because I think that uh, looking at developments in all these fields, we're reaching a situation uh, where it's clear that a very extensive convergence and consilience is on the cards. Uh, and I'll try to explain that, but in, in uh, uh, obviously I can't do so in much detail. And many of the issues are technical, but I think that when one goes through the technicalities, these uh, resolve in the right direction. So some things that are said to happen over the first year of life, uh, well, in developmental psychology, the infant learns to regulate its emotions uh, by the experience of forming uh, emotional bonds, attachment bonds, with its carers. And these reach a kind of uh, initial consolidation that you can then trace through the rest uh, of life at the end of the first year. Uh, in a way, this was a tremendously interesting development for psychoanalysis and part of what uh, 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 we'll be talking about today because it did establish something that had been uh, in uh, great dispute in the psychoanalytic community. Uh, it had always been uh, disputed by non-Kleinians that however uh, appealing the mechanisms uh, and basic story Klein told it couldn't all happen in the first year of life. Uh, but it does appear that the infant's basic emotional relations with others and the basic prototypes that will govern its emotional relations, that it will drift from only uh, uh, under the impact of quite strong experience throughout life, that those are set by the end of the first year and that therefore the important things do happen prior to that and we'll try to focus on those. Uh, and in psychoanalysis uh, it's held that uh, 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 the infant starts out uh, in uh, a, a state that is mostly primary process or fantasy uh, and that the initial fantasies are those of very good objects or very bad objects and it tries to uh, identify with the former and attack or avoid uh, the latter but they're all derived from uh, its main object of experience at this time, which is the caring uh, feeding mother or her breast, who's uh, felt uh, as very good in periods of good experience when needs are being met and uh, uh, comfort provided and uh, very bad uh, in periods of bad experience. And this uh, 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 initial fantasy beginning is then supplemented by uh, experience based on perception uh, until uh, uh, at around five months the infant starts to recognize that there aren't, isn't this variety of objects in its world, it just has one mother who's therefore unique and irreplaceable uh, and in light of this it uh, regulates its aggression, withdraws projections uh, and so forth develops empathic concern. Uh, and in neuroscience, in at least the particular kind of neuroscience that I'm going to concentrate on, the brain is seen as constantly building in the cortex, the cerebral cortex, which is uh, unformed at birth. There are some handouts there on the... Uh, uh, building a model of the world external to itself, that is, of the world external to the brain, of the uh, infant's body and self in the world. And it constructs this world, it constructs this model uh, 
as a means of making sense of its very fragmentary uh, perceptual input. So the brain uses its perceptual input, which is after all its only form of contact with the world, to create a model of the causes of that input external to itself in the world. And this model is then registered in consciousness by the brain producing conscious experience of the causes of sensory input. Uh, and uh, in this, the brain comes to regulate, uh, the cortex comes to regulate things that are located in subcortical regions of the brain. It comes to regulate, in particular, the deep generators of uh, REM, uh, which uh, continues being generated throughout life uh, in uh, a particular kind of dreaming sleep, uh, but also the subcortical generators of drive and emotion and desire, which are, of course, active from birth. Uh, so we can say, just as a kind of summary of what the brain does, is the brain converts this fragmentary, these fragmentary impingements on the sensory receptors, it converts them to uh, uh, conscious experience of the causes of those impingements on the sensory uh, receptors. Uh, and, and that means something that we should all accept and probably do all accept, which is that the conscious image of the world that we all have right now is entirely produced internally to the brain. It isn't that the brain somehow sucks the world into itself. It's that the brain stays there and constructs within itself an image of the world outside, which is that image that we have when we open our eyes and see the world. And that image, of course, is uh, full of uh, expectations. It's full of our expectations about the people we meet, the objects we see, the whole world around us. We, it's a world that's familiar to us, that we think we know how it will behave, so the moment a bit of sensory input is converted into conscious experience, at that moment, something relatively familiar and permanent is abstracted out of this <coughs> flux at the sensory uh, receptors. And that alone, that is simply having an experience is already casting a predictive interpretation over the fleeting sensory data. In this kind of neuroscientific perspective, perception itself uh, is a form of hypothetical inference. Uh, and that such hypothetical inference can be mistaken is absolutely evident from one of the most familiar phenomena in our lives, those of that of dreaming. Uh, in dreaming, the brain does its thing of creating a conscious image of the world, but in this case, its image-creating activities are cut off from the sensory receptors because they're chemically closed or actually shut in the case of the eyes. Uh, so, uh, uh, in this case, the brain is doing something quite different from interpreting the flow of sensory data, and in this case, uh, a, a contemporary neuroscience has found that the brain is actually uh, consolidating the day's memories, uh, and in that sense, adding to and altering and in uh, this free energy neuroscience of Carl Friston, simplifying uh, the brain's model of the world. Now, simplification in Friston's <coughs> terms is uh, a technical uh, term, but what it comes to is reducing the number of hypotheses in the model 
or the extent to which those uh, hypotheses are altered. And uh, you can see that dream construed as fantasy would be doing that if it were uh, as uh, in this hypothesis, if it were operating on the memories of the day as those memories are passed from the hippocampus where they're stored temporarily to the cerebral cortex uh, because when they're passed, the old memories in the cerebral cortex that constitute the brain's model of the world those old memories are made, they're re-aroused and made plastic in order to be integrated with the new memories. They have to be plastic to be integrated with the new memories. Uh, and in that period of plasticity, the emotions which are also aroused, the emotions connected with the old memories, are also <coughs> re-aroused and these are modified, the emotions are modified by the experience of dreaming. So dreaming is the final stage of memory consolidation uh, and it's the stage of memory consolidation that alters the emotional structure of the whole model, potentially. And you can see that very clearly if you take Freud's Dream of Irma's ex uh, injection as an example, because uh, what you find in Freud's Dream of Irma's injection is, first he understands it in relation to superficial memories, uh, memories of the day before, of Otto coming by his house, saying Irma's looking better but not well, him thinking uh, this is a criticism, him writing up Irma's case history, because we can see that the criticism has aroused guilt, uh, and uh, uh, then finally going to sleep, and you can see that uh, Freud's real associations, the key associations that enable us to understand the dream more deeply, actually just come from the deeper memories with which this, uh, these superficial memories would be being uh, integrated. And those deeper memories are, of course, the memories of his guilt about injection uh, when he comes to remember how uh, he killed a patient by uh, uh, an injection and how uh, he led his friend to start uh, and mentor to start injecting cocaine, a friend who died in a cocaine hallucinosis that Freud uh, felt extremely guilty about. Indeed, in the course of the dream, Freud says uh, that it struck him that it was almost like uh, an act of destiny that his uh, patient he'd killed should have had the same name as his daughter and it seemed to him that his daughter might have to die because uh, uh, for a moment because as an eye for an eye because he'd killed a patient with the same name. Here of course Freud was stumbling first appearance in the first dream he analyzed of the superego uh, and he said that he noticed that he'd been collecting against himself uh, everything he might bring against himself well, those that the emotion that the dream is working on is guilt. Uh, and it's the guilt connected with those past memories. And you can then see that the, the dream which produces this marvelous scene of complete innocence where Freud discovers that Otto's given Irma a toxic sexual injection and can say at the end of the dream, one does not make injections of that kind so thoughtlessly, so that emotionally Freud is off the hook about injections completely by the end of the dream. So that he, his uh, uh, job of reconciliation will have been to uh, minimize all the toxicity of the guilt that had been aroused by uh, um, uh, the memories that were uh, aroused as he consolidated this, and the guilt can uh, be uh, put back to a manageable level uh, while not disturbing the veridical content of the memory at all. Freud perfectly well remembers what's happened. Now, uh, 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 I've put some recent work from uh, uh, work on this 
uh, in the notes, and uh, you can see it there in the first note discussions of dreaming and memory consolidation, and the way in particular dreams uh, relieve the, the uh, adverse emotions connected with dreams uh, throughout the deep model. Uh, but I'm not really going to talk about that because we're going to have to move to the first year of life. But what that does show is that in this neuroscience of dreaming as well, there is a function in relation to the dreamer's model of the world of the primary process as it appears in Freud. It's the primary process as it appears in dreaming that is doing this emotion massaging work. Uh, okay, but now, uh, and in doing this, this is a part of the brain's minimizing free energy in Friston's sense, because free energy just is constituted by the errors the brain makes in predicting sensory input. Free energy just is prediction error, which becomes sensory input. Uh, but then uh, 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 that, uh, uh, that also means that Freud's use of, uh, that uh, Friston's use of free energy is exactly parallel to Freud's. Free energy is introduced into the nervous system by sensory input, uh, and it is uh, minimized by the work of the drives and the emotions in daytime, and although Freud doesn't say this, it's perfectly coherent uh, with his view to regard dreaming as playing a role in minimizing free energy as well. Uh, and we'll get to that. But in this form of neuroscience, it's discussed in terms of the brain in creating these expectations. Uh, the brain is doing, is using something that are kind of analogs of scientific hypotheses. Uh, so as Friston says, the brain is an inference machine or hypothesis tester. It works with models that predict what the sensory input should be if it had these environmental causes, and the best explanation then gives you the conscious experience of that cause. Uh, 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 but if we go back to the beginning of life now, or to uh, life uh, from getting out of the womb, then uh, the initial hypotheses, according to Friston and uh, Alan Hobson now, uh, the initial hypotheses are innate, and they're formed in the womb uh, in what they call a virtual reality. So, from even before birth, the brain is generating uh, something like experience, uh, and it will certainly start generating experience at birth, and the model that it will originally use will be a virtual model, a model that is ye as yet has not been formed by experience or by sensory experience, postnatal uh, sensory experience, uh, 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 but will then become uh, this uh, more realistic model of the world. So is. Friston uh, and Hobson say, we're born with a virtual reality model of ourselves in the world, but sensory exchanges with the real world quickly mold this into a generative model with nightly reprises from predicting sensory inputs during sleep. Uh, well, of course, the nightly reprise is dreaming uh, in which the model is worked with yet again uh, in this way that uh, simplifies it, uh, and that process is really parallel <coughs> to finishing off the uh, tasks, the emotional tasks of the day with a fantasy. Because Freud's fantasy of everything being right with him on the topic of injection finishes off the work of worrying and starting to get depressed about uh, his 
use of uh, injections and therapy and so on, the process which began during the day. So we have essentially the same process described uh, from, uh, on the one hand, the Fristonian neuroscience, and also it's the same uh, description uh, that's given by Hannah Siegel uh, of uh, the modification of innate fantasy by experience. She too compares this to uh, hypothesis testing where the infant's initial fantasies provide its first hypotheses which are then tested against reality like a theory and to the extent that the infant can accept the verdict of reality to that extent because it's uh, emotionally difficult to uh, test your fantasies in this way uh, to that extent the infant can learn and build its sense of reality and transform during the daytime transform fantasy into thought uh, and that's uh, really then it's exactly the same process uh, in transforming fantasy into thought, the infant is transforming a virtual reality generative model into a realistic generative model that really will tell it where it is in the world and what's uh, coming in its sensory input. So we really have a very similar theoretical framework there. Klein, uh, uh, Siegel also understands being uh, in these terms uh, uh, so uh, the two schools of thought that we're thinking about are actually here very much using the same concepts but uh, from uh, completely derived from different sources okay uh, and in both Freud uh, and Friston there's a relatively simple <coughs> structure Free energy is introduced into the nervous system by sensory input. The most important input is the input from the systems that sense how things are inside the body because it's that uh, if things go wrong there that the most serious consequences follow. Uh, and then uh, um, it minimizes uh, the errors that it detects by motor activity and this includes physiological actions uh, and also finally actions in which uh, the skeletal muscles are moved uh, and these actions serve to uh, satisfy the needs uh, to pacify the emotions uh, that are roused by uh, the uh, 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 rise in free energy or in uh, prediction error particularly emanating uh, from the inside of the body which must be protected uh, at all costs uh, outside. Uh, and so uh, this uh, is a situation in which the uh, sensory input of prediction error is corrected by uh, the activities of the drives and the basic emotions in making us do the things we do to satisfy our desires uh, and pacify our emotions. And just as the overall process of maintaining the body uh, equilibrium described as homeostasis, just as that uh, returns things to a set of equilibrium <coughs> points, so uh, we can uh, treat uh, the whole overall working of the drives and emotions as well as having in each person sets of equilibria points, uh, equilibrium points to which the individual reverts uh, when uh, the individual has done its best uh, that day with uh, the problems of life and this will be the, uh, the best minimization of free energy that the individual can attain. Uh, now, uh, if we look at the uh, uh, situation in uh, the neuroscience of the emotions, uh, there's a, a diagram that's reproduced in your handout where you can see the uh, in red the, uh, <coughs> the some of the areas of the brain in which there are neural systems that are in, input systems detecting uh, the uh, 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 
uh, oncoming free energy and then uh, the systems that arouse uh, the physiological and other actions to meet them. Some of them are in purple. And Panksepp, yet Panksepp has made a particularly uh, deep study of these. Uh, and the basic emotion generating systems, uh, which he describes as sitting in the brain stem over homeostasis proper uh, and giving rise to attachment, which is the massive regulatory linchpin uh, system of the human brain. So you can see that in uh, this quotation by Panksepp, he's thinking of the process of attachment as being driven by these basic emotions, which are themselves aroused by sensory prediction error and serve to correct that sensory prediction error. Uh, now, there's uh, a, uh, uh, just to show that everything is kosher here, uh, um, I have a, another slide here from a very good recent summary of these matters by <coughs> Damasio, uh, where Damasio uh, um, has the interceptive system graphed there and the extraceptive system, the eyes, and ears, and so on there. And he has a number of examples uh, of the uh, 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 thirst uh, um, running into a sharp object, seeing a bear, getting bad news. And he describes the physiological story uh, by which these sources of free energy, these warning, either actually marks of onset prediction error, I mean the thirst arises because there's the stuff that's detecting water in the bloodstream is saying uh, should get some water in there. Uh, it, there's impending prediction error there and likewise with the bear. Uh, big danger to uh, the self. Uh, so you can see that this, it, we, this dialectic of something put in by sensory input that is then corrected <coughs> by motor output, which is uh, quantified by Friston uh, as free energy uh, is uh, then uh, 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 gives you a description of the way the brain works and we can make this a relatively straightforward description if we think of the brain as constantly returning to these points of equilibrium and the idea would be that everybody has their own his or her own uh, set of points of equilibrium that depend upon your hereditary and your heredity and your environment and all these things, but they're, they're what has come out of your, sen your sensory encounter with the world so far, the way your desires have been satisfied and your needs uh, and so forth and the strategies you've learned and all that. And some, if you have a lot of emotional conflict, you'll obviously have a different equilibrium from somebody else because if you have a lot of emotional conflict that will be a constant ongoing source, an ineradicable source of prediction error because one party to the conflict won't be getting any help or satisfaction. Uh, uh, and so we can think of the individual as uh, departing from and returning to this uh, uh, by uh, means that relate to the Freudian primary and secondary processes. And uh, so uh, in all of these things then we have this really uh, basic idea that we start with an innate genetically specified kind of fantasy. Calling it genetically specified isn't leaving out all the contextualizing of it that goes on uh, in the womb. Uh, and then in the first period of waking this model is modified by waking experience from postnatal uh, internal and external sensory input, uh, and it may be somewhat simplified or uh, some of the heat taken off by waking fantasy. Uh, and it's given a Kleinian view of dreams or a psychoanalytic view of dreams where a dream is an attempt to create a reparative fantasy ultimately. Uh, or in optimal circumstances, then this too will be an ongoing part of the process. We should just incorporate this into our psychoanalytic understanding. We should understand that dreams, in 
fortunate cases, dreams do something for us that's important emotionally every night. Uh, and then we have uh, something that's common to both uh, models. There's the initial model, there's the waking experience uh, modifies it, then the dream experience modifies it, the way Freud's dream modified his model that was starting to get into a depressed movement away from equilibrium by uh, worrying about uh, injections, and this just continues throughout life. And as I say, I think the parallel is uh, exact because the Fristonian process of, of model simplification can be construed as one in which the dream is, if successful, completing the work of the drives and emotions aroused during the day. Okay, and uh, if we look at these uh, emotion systems that are described by uh, Panksepp, we can see that actually they uh, very much do the job of the Freudian drives and except that they're much more open and intelligible to us than the Freudian drives. We know what they consist in, and we know that what they consist in is clinically absolutely relevant. Uh, because uh, um, uh, we know, I mean, uh, 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 and so we can see them as working as life drives when they're directed at mothers and carers as gratifiers of need and desire. In that case, the Friston basics, the uh, Panksepp basics of seeking and exploration, play, care, nurturance, uh, and lust are serving in trust building, gratifying interactions as bases of attachment, positive attachment, and what will later be regarded as uh, love. And, but the uh, negative aspects of separation distress, uh, of uh, panic and grief, that's one, uh, one of the basic systems. It's shown here uh, in uh, the human brain and there in the guinea pig uh, brain. Uh, uh, when when uh, separation distress, panic, and grief uh, are in operation, uh, and uh, uh, directed at the mother uh, as they must be, sorry, separate and distress, uh, rage and fear uh, are uh, figure in earliest infancy and they must figure in early, earliest infancy as a signal of urgent need to the mother. So it's very important that these uh, emotions in the form that will later be aggressive or the death drive, uh, in that form that they are first directed at the mother because it's only by hearing those things in the infant's cry that the mother can sometimes be maximally uh, motivated. Uh, it's the infant's urgent coercive signal of unmet need. Uh, um, and... Uh, uh, we'll see that it plays a role in attachment, leading to violent or coercive attachment even at three to five years. Uh, now, but there's also something about uh, the human animal that's particularly interesting, uh, uh, which is that uh, <coughs> because of our extremely long uh, period of infantile dependence, it's extremely important for the baby to uh, have the mother's care. Uh, if it doesn't, it will uh, wither and die early on and uh, it will uh, have uh, uh, defective development later on. Uh, and that means that those <coughs> infants who by any form of emotional manipulation got the attention and affection of their parents as opposed to some other child, or so worked on the parents' emotions that the parents did not have a competitor baby for a good while, 
infants that in that way defeated or eliminated sibling rivals had an evolutionary advantage. And that's the thing that shows in uh, the hostility to parental procreation that we're familiar with uh, in psychoanalysis uh, and in the often ferocious uh, sibling rivalry uh, and also the simply wanting to get all one can out of the mother uh, that we find uh, in uh, the infant's uh, early relation to its mother. So uh, the importance of all these things uh, 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 in psychoanalysis just comes to the fore when we take this neuroscientific version uh, of the drives. Uh, so now let's uh, take that and let's remember that we're uh, in this. If we go back for a second to this, this of course starts out the infant can do nothing about the mounting discomfort of uh, the sensory onslaught at birth. It can do nothing but scream and attract the mother's, scream and kick and attract the mother's attention. And it's then when the mother comes and gives attention that the infant can start to learn. Freud has the first learning uh, being that the infant learns to move its head when the wish-fulfilling primary process gives it enough peace from the sensory onslaught that it can attend to the situation. Uh, so at first, uh, uh, the infant's contribution to this is very small, uh, and it's that that grows uh, throughout life. And now uh, I want to just check uh, to go over with you some of the ways that this uh, develops during the first year. Uh, so, uh, and this too, I think, is on your handout, this chart. Uh, so, uh, we start out with uh, the uh, uh, emotion systems operating in this uh, dual way. They're operating uh, 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 to bring rage, fear, and separation distress to the fore when the infant is frustrated. They're operating to bring exploration, play, uh, and so forth to the fore, uh, and uh, positive feeling generally to the fore when uh, the infant is being gratified. Uh, and uh, uh, during the first, uh, during the first uh, 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 two months of life, uh, well, uh, we can notice a lot of things. During the second month, uh, in benign circumstances, the infant develops these proto-conversations, uh, which involve time-taking uh, exchanges of emotion uh, with the mother, like in playing peekaboo or things like that, but also just in, oh yes, and chatting and so forth. Uh, uh, but at this same period, a still face will often rouse rage in the infant, if the mother just gives the infant a still face. That's because unresponsiveness is such a threat. Uh, um, uh, and uh, at this time, uh, the infant already, of course, knows its mother well enough that if you show the infant a strange mother in the sense that you uh, have the mother speaking but with a stranger's voice, for example, uh, then the infant turns away in fear. It finds this really, really distressing. Uh, but still, the infant does not, has not yet apparently registered that it has just one mother. Because, and that's the meaning of the multiple mothers okay there, because if you show the infant a display of more than one mother using mirrors, or two mothers and a stranger, or one mother and two strangers, uh, <coughs> About the multiple mothers, the infant seems glad that so many have turned up. And uh, if, if there's a mother and uh, uh, if there's two mothers and a stranger, the infant will interact preferentially with the mother uh, and bypass the stranger, usually. Uh, 
And at this same period, uh, if you frustrate the infant, it will get angry, it will produce, activate the rage system, but it gets angry at the hand. Uh, and uh, 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 and also, though, even this early, the infant is extremely sensitive to helpfulness versus non-helpfulness, or good versus bad in a form that it can understand. Because if you show it little puppet shows of one character helping another, or one character hindering another, the infant will look preferentially at the helpful figures and avoid looking at the hindering figures, even at three months. So all of this is going on. The infant is processing uh, uh, people, but it, it's not taking them as whole objects, but it's processing people already as good or bad. Uh, and as we'll see, during this period, while the infant is still not got the mother consolidated as a unique individual, one can predict disorganized attachment at 12 months from the interaction between mother and baby at four months. And this is very striking, we'll come to it in a moment. Uh, but now at five months, which remarkably was the age at which Klein said the infant interjected a whole object uh, and uh, started the inception of the depressive position. Uh, uh, at five months, if you show the infant the multiple mothers, the infant is now distressed in the way it used to be distressed when you showed it mother face with a strange voice. Uh, also then, uh, by seven months, uh, if you make the infant angry with your hand, it gets angry at your face. And it also gets angry in a way that shows how much, what kind of expectations, how much it's learned, and what kind of expectations it has about its caring figures. If the mother makes the infant angry twice, say by holding its hand down until it fusses and howls, something like that, or it doesn't have to be that bad. Well, all right, this happens, like when she's putting on its clothes and things like that. If uh, a stranger makes the infant angry twice, well, it gets angry twice. But if first a stranger makes the baby angry, and then the mother makes the baby angry, the infant goes ballistic because the mother has betrayed its expectation uh, that it will help it where the interferences of strangers are concerned. And shortly after this, there are two big developments, which is that the infant starts to show rage in protest at its mother's leaving it alone. In many cases, it's eighth month separation distress, uh, but it's separation anger, and a fear of strangers, and it's particularly strangers with beards, <laughs> even in bearded cultures, interestingly enough. Now, that, I think, uh, indicates that uh, uh, it's uh, something to do with the father, and if one understood that uh, uh, now that the infant has got the mother together, the father becomes the first repository of the infant's projections that make him a bad and separating object, uh, separating the infant from the mother object, uh, and uh, th that would be a likely possible origin of this uh, remarkable fact that uh, practically the only innate fear, uh, in a, no innate fear of snakes, lions, tigers, <coughs> poisons, none of that, insects, none of that in us. These are picked up from uh, people's reactions in the context usually, but there's an innate fear of men with beards. <laughs> uh, 
or strangers with beards. Uh, then at uh, 10 months, uh, there's a big step forward, which is the development of intersubjectivity. The uh, it, infant and mother both become aware, or the mother's always been aware of things like this, but the infant becomes aware that the mother is aware of the infant <coughs> being aware of some other thing. Uh, so the infant is aware that the mother is aware that the infant is aware, and this is quite uh, uh, a powerful step forward. Uh, and the infant uh, picks up now, clearly picks up many of its emotional responses from the mother, and it often looks to the mother for a clue uh, <coughs> as to response. For example, when a stranger comes on scene, the infant checks whether the stranger can be trusted, and when the mother is friendly, the infant considers being so. And then finally at 12 months we have this consolidation of attachment uh, in the strange situation which shows uh, in the infants uh, being placeable in the strange situation test, which we'll uh, pay some attention to in a minute, in the infants being placeable in the strange situation test as securely attached or uh, uh, avoidantly attached or ambivalently attached or uh, uh, having disorganized attachment which we'll come to uh, in a moment um, and uh, by this time the infant has clear uh, responsiveness to the uh, morality plays uh, um, uh, 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 we have a one-year-old who watches the puppet show and uh, he uh, 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 doesn't just uh, withhold a sweet, which is the usual response, but he slaps the, <laughs> the bad puppet. Uh, so the infant has got its, beginning to get its moral and emotional world really very highly organized by this time. And uh, these things are put together uh, in a single chart, which is there, but now let's look at attachment. And the, uh, the, the main thing about the <coughs> strange situation test, the uh, protocol uh, there, is that, look, what happens is, well, the infant and mother settle into the situation, and the infant's playing and exploring. Note those Panksep systems are on. And uh, then a stranger comes in, and that is pressing on the infant's fear of strangers, which it's now pretty much overcome, but which coalesced after it realized it just had one mother, so the stranger wasn't it. Uh, so it's this bit of the strange situation the response to the stranger, is pressing on what, in light of these other developmental phenomena we can see, is an old fear that the infant has plausibly overcome, but maybe not so completely. Uh, and then uh, the parent leaves the infant with the stranger, thus adding separation distress uh, and uh, anger <coughs> to uh, the mix, anger at the mother for going, uh, subjecting itself so the infant now has this complex attitude towards its mother uh, as well as the stranger. Uh, and then uh, this is uh, basically uh, repeated except in spades. Now the infant comes back, they make it up or not. Uh, and now uh, the mother just leaves the infant alone by itself, having done this to it previously, as if uh, this wasn't enough, uh, and then the stranger comes in so that the infant has to put up with the stranger entirely alone, after having been left alone, uh, and then the situation ends. And of course the babies, uh, the babies being reckoned secure or insecure depends upon how it copes. And how it copes is an index of the strength of its emotional conflict as between the desire to recover 
its previous balanced relationship with its mother, and its carrying on being angry, fearful, and so forth. Uh, and to the extent that the infant handles this conflict smoothly, it's regarded as secure. Secure infants just are the ones that handle that conflict smoothly and return to exploration and play, so that in Panksepian terms, their separation distress system having been activated, their fear system having been activated, they can, and their rage system having been activated at the mother for putting all this on them, they can turn those off and return to exploration and play. And the insecure infants are those that can't. Uh, the, uh, uh, the ones that are classed as avoidant are ones who suppress uh, the rage and fear, uh, particularly the rage, but the rage shows if the mother starts to pick the infant up or something, if it stiffens and turns away angrily, and they have uh, higher cortisol levels, stress levels for some time. Uh, in the case of uh, ambivalent resistant infants, uh, uh, they both, uh, the separation distress system remains uh, active, they seek contact, but rage is active as well. They behave punitively towards the mother, they so to speak hug and hit. Uh, and, uh, in the case of disorganized infants, the combinations of rage, fear, separation, distress, and so on are too much, and they cannot put together a coherent response at all. But their basic sense of the unreliability and untrustworthiness of the object is shown that at three to five <coughs> years, uh, they become controlling, uh, sometimes violently uh, controlling, and sometimes controlling in a kind of coercive caregiving uh, manner. Uh, but uh, uh, this is an outcome of this uh, conflict. And of course, this is a part of the psychoanalytic model. So the attachment and psychoanalysis and neuroscience now are all exactly on the same page about this. Uh, now, as many of you will know, there's also uh, this adult measure of attachment where you ask the uh, adult, lots of questions about its own uh, um, relations with its parents, you, and particularly you, uh, you spring a form of free association, you ask it to uh, come up with five adjectives that describe uh, the early relationships, and then you ask it for backup on those. Uh, and uh, overall, and this too is on your handout, uh, overall, the results are that the adults fall into four categories that correspond to the infant categories. Uh, there's, uh, to the avoidant <coughs> infants, there correspond the uh, dismissing adults uh, who basically say these things don't matter. They had a perfectly normal childhood about which, however, now come to think of it, they can remember nothing. Uh, and they had excellent relations with their parents about which if they try to remember something they usually come up with something that contradicts that. Uh, and to the ambivalent resistant uh, infants there correspond the preoccupied adults who are, when asked to talk about it, are right back in there uh, talking about how the mother did this and then I said this and my brother said that and we could never get it and we fought about this and then... and. Uh, it used to be that these were done by uh, transcript, and it was always that the, they were evaluated by transcript. There now a lot of video evaluation is done in different forms. It used to be that the preoccupied ones had really thick transcripts. The avoidant and dismissive ones had really thin transcripts. Uh, and uh, the disorganized ones uh, um, uh, show, uh, they, may, uh, they say very bizarre things that someone was killed by a childhood thought, or um, uh, that uh, someone who is dead is still alive, and there's extensive eulogy, uh, and so forth. Uh, so we can see, and the remarkable thing is that uh, uh, there's a very high carryover from the mother's adult category to the infant's strange situation 12-month category. Uh, uh, 
uh, that's one of the most striking things. It's about 65% chance that the infant will, uh, if you give the, the uh, adult attachment interview to the mother while she's pregnant, her unborn infant will wind up uh, in the uh, infant correspondent to the category that she scores uh, if given the strange situation test at 12 months. This, of course, is explicable by identification. The infant, in, over the course of childhood, identifies with its mother's responses uh, to it and its, uh, her ways of handling emotion. The categories the other way is, well, you, you have a better chance of winding up, in, or as good a chance of winding up, in your original category later on. Uh, and, uh, but uh, these now, uh, they can be blown off course, and uh, there's a little bit of return to uh, uh, what's thought of as uh, the genetic, uh, underlying genetic situation, but it's still very impressive forward-going correlation as well. Now, uh, let's look at this very striking fact, finally, uh, about uh, that uh, of the <coughs> prediction of 12-month disorganized attachment and all the uh, problems that go with it uh, from uh, interaction at 12 months, at four months, and uh, here we have uh, generation of disorganized as opposed to secure attachment. These are, the, the technique is to get a video set up that allows you to look at the interactions between the mothers and the infants' facial expressions and to do very subtle timing uh, 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 relations on these. And uh, th they really are extraordinarily striking and they're particularly striking when the videos are slowed down, because in the infant's case, you can often see a whole series of emotions passing over its face before it settles on the one that it's settling on. Uh, uh, but uh, at any rate, here's uh, that you can, and you can see the difference. Uh, in the first case, something starts to go wrong. Uh, the mother and infant are both uh, in a positive state, and the mother leans in. Uh, uh, when the baby's got its arms and head back, but the, she seems to have leaned in too fast because the baby looks away uh, and uh, its face changes and the mother moves back responsively. Uh, and then uh, the baby uh, reorients and shows its lower lip and the mother shows her lower lip. She's mirroring the baby to the baby. And in that, she's giving the baby <coughs> an outside for the emotion that the baby is feeling inside. She's giving the baby something that the baby can learn from uh, in its own understanding. Now, at this, now we're at the physiological level of response, but still, its own understanding of its own emotional state. Uh, then uh, 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 the baby starts to reach, the mother, uh, but now not Smiling, reaches, uh, moves forward, uh, they both reach, start to smile, they smile, and they end on this note where something that started to go wrong in their interaction got repaired by the mother's sensitivity to the baby's expressions. And in the case of the mother who's on the way to producing a disorganized infant, uh, we have something quite different to the infant's distress the mother shows surprise, she then smiles, trying to smile the infant out of it. Uh, um, the infant gets more distressed and she still smiles, then she looks away. The infant is not going to get any change for his distress. He's not going to get any means of coping with or acknowledging his distress. She's not acknowledging it. Uh, she gives him the stable face, the stable face, and the stable face. Now, what's happening here is readily understandable in the kind of terms that Bean introduced to describe uh, uh, the interaction of a mother who is, because of her own uh, um, uh, fears and so on, uh, because she's afraid of, she has to keep the emotions that the baby is expressing at a distance from herself. She's unable to metabolize them and give the baby the kind of uh, 
intellectually and emotionally nourishing response that the other mother gives. And uh, if one thinks about this in terms of the infant's identification with the mother's attitude, then the infant will be identifying with forming as its own an intolerant attitude towards its own distress. Uh, intolerant, unresponsive attitude towards its own distress. And uh, this will set itself up for conflict within itself, as well as the kind of conflict that we're watching uh, enacted in the mother. So the psychoanalytic understanding of this and the attachment understanding and the neuroscientific understanding, again, are going hand in hand. Uh, now, uh, uh, I just want to take a couple of uh, examples now. Uh, here's uh, a little girl in the strange situation. It's a late strange situation uh, examination, but still good. And she approaches with her arms outstretched, and then she stops. She moves her arms, circles away like an airplane with a blank, dazed expression on her face. Now, a securely attached child would come and uh, <coughs> perhaps embrace the mother, but this we're getting this disorganized behavior instead. Uh, and then later we see her being extremely controlling and coercive with her mother at 32 months. Uh, she screams, no, put it back. Her mother falls in with it. Then uh, when she's playing with a little boy, you can't have cake now, you can't have cake, get some dishes, don't do that. She pushes him away, pushes him down. We can see that she's got, uh, already got difficulties with aggression in relating to other people. Uh, there's something similar uh, with uh, this uh, little boy. Uh, he's got this odd situation, odd behavior in the strange situation gasping, gurgling noise, hunching, and so forth, dazed. And now when he plays, a little girl asks him to play. He takes the doll and alternates between brushing its hair tenderly and smashing it on the floor. Uh, uh, and she tries to play along, uh, and then she says she's going, he grabs the bus, and well, uh, and similarly he behaves strangely, not uh, so aggressively to the other little boys, to the doll, but with a definite sense of not uh, understanding what he's doing. Uh, and these same infants also later can be seen splitting the parents in their relations with the parents. Uh, so at dinner, Sam, the boy that was playing in such a odd way before, uh, the mother speaks to her husband through him, and he speaks to the mother through her. And they both gang up on the father at dinner. So he's doing what? He's behaving in a way that's forming an alliance with the mother that would have been the kind of alliance that would have made it less likely that uh, he had to compete with siblings. Uh, and the same applies to the uh, other uh, uh, to the little girl, uh, uh, she uh, teams up with the father to disregard the mother's uh, comments, uh, and she's again forming an, an emotional alliance with the father against the mother, setting the father against the mother. Okay, well, just to summarize what's happening here, and this is a very bad slide, didn't come out right, but to summarize what's happening here, in this early episode that we saw, what we saw was that the infant was not being given the kind of experience that would have enabled it to learn to move away from the kind of split between bad object and good object and, and the kind of underlying uh, system of projection and so on that it was originally dealing with. It's been deprived of that experience during the fourth month of life, deprived of something that would have enabled it to learn its way away from fantasy, to replace fantasy hypotheses with more realistic ones. And that's left these uh, kids uh, in this state. Now that was what was supposed to be 
shown in that la this last slide, uh, and it isn't very clearly shown. But uh, 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 the infant has failed to learn not to aggress, uh, because aggression is a part of that early good object, bad object state. In a way, it's not part of the later ones. Okay. These very precise observations were 2010, or they were published in 2010, uh, although she had been doing, uh, Beatrice Beebe had been doing this kind of work for uh, some years. She, uh, uh, and she's just published a book now. But of course, the basic facts about attachment have been known since the 70s, the 1970s. Mm -hmm. The neuroscience, the uh, article where Friston and Hobson took on the primary process or fantasy as the starting point in the form of a virtual reality was just published this year. So that and Friston's neuroscience has really only been going since about 2007. It hit its stride. So this is a very recent development uh, in those terms and that's why it hasn't yet been put together with uh, these other things in a way that I uh, trust it will be. Because, of course, the connection with dreams means that uh, uh, what should issue from this uh, is also a similar account in that school of neuroscience <coughs> of uh, psychosis uh, or uh, fictive experience and delusion uh, in psychosis. Now, that the the possibility of that is definitely a part that they know about of their framework, but uh, um, I think that they'll now bring uh, this in more to their framework as uh, I'm looking forward to their doing it. I hope they will. Mm. Oh. Uh, the, the emphasis that you've given is the conciliance between psychoanalysis and neuroscience. <clears throat> And that could be a, a sort of a somewhat of a political choice to say, look, there's nothing that these two fields have to fear or reject from each other. Or it could be the case that there is a consilience, which leads to a question, is there an example or an um, is there even an intention or anything in the offing in which the neuroscience would not confirm, or we don't know which would confirm the other? That is, is neuroscience up to being corrected by psychoanalysis? Is neuroscience in the position to correct psychoanalysis? Well, see, in a way, um, the answer to both those is yes, because uh, the neuroscience has a framework but it doesn't really have content within that framework. Uh, people who uh, uh, adhere to the tenets of Fristonian neuroscience uh, are committed to the view that uh, the generative model that they so pay such attention to emerges out of a virtual reality and then goes back into virtual reality mode uh, during dreaming. Uh, but they haven't accepted Freudian theory of dreams. It's only when you put the two together. But this would give them a place to look, and it would give them a place to, uh, in particular, to start doing something that lots of dream studies have done, which is trace more and more of the memories connected with dreams. Uh, and uh, 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 just by doing that, uh, and, uh, uh, 
so far I, I didn't know anybody but Friston himself who uh, uh, is inclined to accept that what he calls reduction of the complexity of the model uh, is uh, the kind of thing that fantasy uh, or wish fulfillment would do. So uh, they have this, because, because I um, am uh, obviously uh, think that psychoanalysis is quite highly independently clinically confirmed, these views, uh, I think they have a lot to learn from psychoanalysis. I mean, they really, it's, it's that really psychoanalysis potentially puts a whole field of dreaming and uh, uh, a, a, a phenomena like delusion, hallucination, and so forth within their neuroscientific grasp if they want to take that up. And I can't believe they won't try, but who knows. But, uh, uh, but also, in a way, the neuroscience has already uh, gone beyond the psychoanalysis in lots of interesting ways, because if this is right, it's told us in a way psychoanalysis never did why we dream. Uh, we dream to have an effect on our models of the world. Uh, and uh, 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 it's told us that dreams are connected with memories in a way that's entirely consistent with psychoanalytic practice, you always interpret dreams from memories mm -hmm. that are linked to the content of the dream. Uh, uh, it's absolutely consistent with the psychoanalytic practice, but we never before have seen dreams as involved in the process of memory consolidation itself. Mm -hmm. We just haven't thought. Psychoanalysis hasn't thought in those terms. So the neuroscience is adding a lot to the psychoanalysis as well, if one cares to. Now, uh, um, if they come into conflict, we just have to see uh, uh, which one uh, produces the better evidence. But uh, uh, in, I don't think there's going to be a conflict. I think there's going to be an increasing consilience myself. Can I just ask, all the way through, you've been referring to the mother and the infant. Has any research ever been done where the main caregiver is not the mother? Yes, a lot, lots of research has been done. Uh, it's been done on gay parents and they, uh, gay male parents, and they seem okay. And I mean, it, uh, uh, now the, for, I'm not really expert on this, and I'm just the the last time I read, which was like four or five months ago. The last time I read the literature was saying uh, it's sensitive parenting that matters, not so much the sex of the parent. But, uh, um, uh, uh, and certainly the father has always been important. And the father is in uh, some ways more important for some things, even in the standard paradigm. It, the, 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 a girl's relationship of attachment is measured in the same way uh, with her father uh, is more important for her teenage social life is more predictive of her teenage social life I think I remember reading than the attachment with the mother uh, which is also but it may, would make sense that uh, I was just remembering yeah. the situation where the father was the only yeah. main carer whether yeah. that would impact and things like um, the, the children being frightened of beards, or that's yeah, thing, well, that still happened in where the main cave or the only cave. Yeah, and <coughs> I, 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 don't, I don't myself know. And single parenting is always extremely difficult. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's actually just too much for any one person, really. So, uh, um, so, uh, uh, and I, so I don't, I don't know anything about <coughs> about attachment in single fathers. There may be uh, such, but I, I don't know. Uh, thank you, sir. Could you um, explain the Bayesian brain? Is that within the neuroscience? Um, yeah, this is the Bayesian brain. Oh. Um, uh, uh, so um, if we go back to
the brain as an infant's machine or hypothesis tester, uh, which approaches sensory data using principles of Bayesian inference, similar to those used in science. Well, um, Bayesian inference is just uh, strict probabilistic inference. So to infer Bayesianly is to infer in accord with the mathematical theory of probability. Now, the brain doesn't in general uh, infer in accord with the mathematical theory of probability because uh, it's got, it's, it has to be doing so much else. But the brain constructs, uh, the brain's model uh, is uh, constructed in hierarchies of Bayesian reasoning. Uh, and the idea of the minimization of free energy, well, strangely enough, free energy as prediction error, free energy is a quantity, or it's a quantitative measure of materials that are available to the brain from inside itself to check its own predictions. So, uh, increases with experience. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so uh, free the the minimization of free energy explains how the brain can build a prob probabilistic model of the world outside just from within itself. It can do it by minimizing free energy, uh, and it does it by uh, following the Bayesian rules, but with them, as it were, weighted towards survival and reproduction uh, rather than a good outcome now. Because uh, it's survival and reproduction rather than getting the answer right by probability that has uh, left the brain, has, has caused the brain to evolve in the way uh, it has. But this is the Bayesian brain. Friston is the Bayesian brain in neuroscience. Yes, so that followed from Sigmund Freud, presumably. Well, uh, no, Freud, Freud's notion of, there's a really interesting thing here, that they both use the notion of free energy, Freud and Friston, mm -hmm. and they use it in a way that, as I've explained, is entirely isomorphic. In both of them it's introduced by uh, sensory input, in both of them it's uh, 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 controlled by motor uh, <coughs> behavior in relation to that, by action in relation to that sensory input, or that's the kind of input that needs to be not just understood but acted on. Uh, but, uh, but Freud, uh, and Leo is an expert on this, but uh, Freud, I think Freud's uh, uh, use of free energy must have come from Helmholtz, where, who was the discoverer, among other things, of the uh, <coughs> conservation of energy, where it was a, a measure of th the thermodynamic energy in a system. Now, and Freud was wrong about that. We get energy into ourselves by eating, yeah. not by things happening in the nervous system. The nervous system generates its own energy from our food. <laughs> so Freud was wrong about that in setting up the neuroscience, but he still used the idea in this marvelously <laughs> prescient way. Thanks for that. Um. I wonder, a, um, I mean, as you know, there's a more enormous growth in the first year of life. And uh, in the, the neurological substrate, is there actual have people noticed or seen Absolutely. the research change? I, I had a slide on this, but I uh, uh, rightly estimated that I probably had too many slides anyway. But uh, yes, the, uh, the uh, infant's brain roughly doubles in mass during over the course of the first year. And most of this appears to be in the creating of synaptic connections that connect the cortex 
with those subcortical mechanisms of drive and emotion. Uh, so the cortex gets its synapses connected and has a lot of synaptic growth. Uh, and the, the cortex and these subcortical regions, they get much more densely connected over the first year because what's happening is at the beginning of the first year, the subcortical mechanisms are in control and the cortex is learning. Uh, so the baby's learning amidst his own emotions, learning about his emotions. But by the end of the first year, the cortex is taking over. So by the time you get to the baby who regulates its anger by what it expects from its mother, the cortex is controlling anger uh, rather than anger just coming as a result of uh, something now not feeling good. Uh, yes, I understand that, but I'm just wondering if... So you get the, 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 the baby, the, the 12 month year old, who, is a, uh, who has got uh, some damage, we'll say. Has it been, has it, have we been able to see any of that damage actually in the anatomy of the brain? Well, there is lots of, there's lots of um, studies of what happened to brain-damaged babies, for sure. Is that what you mean? I'm no, not no, sure. No, I, I just mean in the sense of we're looking at the, the, oh, it, the separation. And this the deficit in experience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I don't think there's been anything that would pick uh, up uh, the, the yeah. differences in brain that are this subtle, although there probably is. I think yeah, they, sure, yeah. they probably have large... I'm just wondering, there, is, there hasn't been any research that's, that's there has, that as yet. There has been, and I'm trying to remember it, but I think there may be something about <coughs> enlarged amygdala. What? I think Alan Shore has worked in this area, and he, and he purports to show um, um, experiential brain deficit as opposed to physiological brain. Yeah, no, no, I was going to say, if, if there's two, you're right, absolutely, but there's two things. There's whether these uh, differences between secure and disorganized attachment would show up by yeah. current uh, methods. Are there studies on Romanian orphans? But, but, the, but, exactly, the studies on, but the deficit caused by lack of caregiving uh, was uh, uh, vividly demonstrated long ago by the scans from kids in Romanian orphanages yeah, who had sure, been yeah. fed and clothed, but uh, uh, that areas of their cort cortices were really, really undeveloped. And this contrasts with another kind of thing, which is how well children who have uh, um, uh, uh, shrunken cortices, naturally shrunken cortices, can do uh, in experience. Uh, there are uh, children with who had were hydroencephalitic, and they've got really very reduced cerebral cortices, but those cortices do most of the normal job, and they can live normal lives. So, last yes, I just just I mean, it's really really very interesting and, and, and mm. fascinating in its in its implications. But uh, just just thinking about my response to the question, because one of the things that this as it were, obviously isn't quite covering, but must be going on alongside it, is the other area that we know more and more about, and that is the hormonal system, and the, you know, the implications for the emotional regulation that are going on. So that's happening, and I don't know where that sits in relation to the brain, per se, but it's another way in which the damage can show up very early on, can't it, that if children Absolutely. have been broke brought up with tremendous inconsistency or trauma that their yeah. own their, their, their hormonal systems are working differently well, from those who have been secure. Yeah, often they have a kind of perpetual stress response exactly. which yeah, hyper, damages hyper memory and things like that. And hyper alert and all of that. Yeah. Mm. Well it is time to stop. So it just remains to say thank you very much again to Professor Hopkins for a very, very interesting talk, very detailed and, and very interesting talk indeed this evening. Thank you very much. <laughs>